Surely the superpower which man has released from within the atom's heart is not one, but many giants. One is the warrior, the destroyer. Another is the engineer seeking to provide vast quantities of energy to run the world's machines. On man's wisdom, on his firmness in the use of that power, depends now the future of his children and his children's children. The optimism of the atomic age went hand in hand with blind faith in the government and their programs. These two things combined created a deadly fallout for the people who built and carried the tenets of and ideals of these decades. The history and the fallout were intertwined with the history of southern Utah and the Colorado Plateau, spanning from Marie Curie and her experiments with uranium and radon to the 1960s and the beginning of the end of the atomic age. Seemingly at the center of it all is the remote Temple Mountain area. Before the beginning of the 20th century, this area was remote as it is now, but almost overnight a town sprang up and stayed for several decades. When all of a sudden it was gone, as quickly as this town had appeared, it became a ghost town. What was left behind was more than just rusting metal and ruins of another year. Though first discovered in 1789 by German scientist Martin Kalproth, research into uranium didn't really occur until Marie and Pierre Curie began their study on radon, a main byproduct of the ore. By 1914, Temple Mountain became a major producer of uranium, as well as other metals and minerals that formed alongside the uranium though the research and commercial focus remained pre predominantly on radon and vanadium. Till 1939, when Enrico Fermi proved that uranium could be artificially broken into two elements. This kicked off the government-run atomic programs of the Cold War. In the early days, they called it tickling the dragon's tail. Eventually, though, the program split. At first, it was just the Manhattan Project, then it became the Civil Defense and the Atomic Energy Commission. All the while, Temple Mountain continued producing ore for them. Soon after the end of World War II, the US government announced that they were going to buy uranium ore and refined uranium known as yellow cake by the pound. This was all in the name of furthering the nuclear arms race that they knew would become inevitable. This caused a gold rush of average citizens to the American Southwest. But unlike gold, the metal in question had much more drastic consequences. Whole families moved out to places like Temple Mountain to make it rich, and by the late 40s, shanty towns dotted the Colorado Plateau. The one surrounding Temple Mountain became known as Temple City. An average uranium boomtown, Temple City only had a few real buildings. The city was made up of trailers, lean-tos, and shacks. The town was a reflection of the mining operations themselves. With no regulations or any sort of order, it was a free-for-all. One man remembers as a child his job was to sort the ore by hand. Holes dotted the sides of the surrounding cliffs. Mine shafts were not built without any thought as to support or disaster-preventing measures. Another man is quoted saying, Ironically, the real threat was a kind of threat that none of them could protect each other from, and the AEC, this fine organization, was also keeping the knowledge of radiation and radon particles from him and every other miner. By the mid-1950s, big companies took over the operations in the area. Though conditions were improved, it was not enough, especially for such a dangerous substance. Just like the uranium boom of the 1950s, Temple City began to decline into the 60s and altogether disappear by 65. Despite that, in its less than two decade existence, Temple City saw over 5,000 tons of product come out of their mine. The miners all left in such a hurry that many even left their cars. In other places on the plateau, hundreds of rusty cars would fill the now empty lots. But in all the hurry, there was more than just rusty cars left behind, and soon the dragon began to bite back. These empty ghost towns had a very real curse, and it all came from humble piles of dirt. 
For every pound of uranium, there are over 200 pounds of tailings. These tailings retain many of the properties of uranium, including radiation. Not only that, the natural byproduct of uranium, radon, as it decays becomes solid and bonds with the dust to make it not only radioactive, but toxic as well. The Environmental Protection Agency's findings on the leftover tailings are quite shocking. Here, deep in the desert, rain is rare, but when it does come, it is heavy and creates temporary rivers called washes. When filled, the washes will carry thousands of pounds of debris across the entire desert. The tailings, which are predominantly sand, are easily pulled from their resting place and spread across hundreds of miles. And in most cases, they left a lot there in the ground. So it's in areas of desert. When the water comes through, it'll take and wash all of the tailings through. It'll, wa it'll fill up in underground reservoirs. Um, we actually have some studies that are being done to find out how much radiation is building up in the sands in places like Lake Powell because all of that sediment gets washed down. And everybody who drinks it or uses it for drinking water everywhere from Utah all the way to California is going to be having an effect of some kind from that uranium tailings and the water runoff. With runoff of this scale, the contaminated water can reach civilization and affect millions of people. It no longer becomes a secluded county's problem, but the entire southwest and even the country. Although efforts have begun to clean up the mess left by the mining companies and the early miners, there is only so much that can be done on such a large scale. A majority of the mines only get fitted with caps and seals to prevent further contamination and endangerment for visitors, but very little has been done for the tailings which continue to pollute the area and even affect visitors of the region. They essentially just mined it and walked away. Well, when the Coal Mining Reclamation Act was signed by Congress in, I think it was 1979, I believe, whenever that was, they included a provision in that to tax the coal mining industry to reclaim other mines. And that includes uranium mining. So. In short, it is a very tough situation. Even for companies and nonprofit organizations, it can be difficult to tackle. And for a majority of people, average people like you and me, it feels like there is not much we can do. To even reach the point where we are now took millions of dollars and decades of time. Yet anywhere from 10 to 50% of mines have yet to be sealed up, and even considerably fewer less tailing piles have been properly taken care of. But there is still something we can do to make a difference. The cleanup effort would not be where it is today without the efforts of dozens upon dozens of regular people learning and speaking out about the subject. And this is not something that just plagues the US alone. This is an issue on a global scale. Countries across the globe have either abandoned mines or continue improper processes being used in the mining. This is not something to stay silent about. That stoic silence brought about the untimely death of thousands of miners and downwinders. To stay silent is to let the cancer, in quite a literal sense, continue to grow.